In this episode, join Shetland resident Natasha and me as we sit at a quiet bay watching the birds that happen by. But before we begin, the Global Bird Fair is taking place this coming weekend, 15th to the 17th of July at the Rutland Showground in central England. I'll be there all three days enjoying the talks, getting my head turned by birding equipment and possible vacations, and meeting up with friends old and new. If you're going to be there, do stop me and say hi. I'll be wearing my new branded t-shirts featuring the show's artwork, so I should be recognisable, and I'd love to meet you. You can find out more about Global Bird Fair and buy your tickets by going to globalbirdfair.org. Welcome to the Casual Birder podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take pleasure in watching the wild birds around me, wherever I am. In my show, I share the joy of birding. I tell you about the birds I've seen, speak with experts and enthusiasts, go on bird outings, and I share stories from birders around the world. Last episode, I spoke with Ewan, the Edinburgh birdwatcher, who's celebrating his 20th year of birding this year. He tells me about his birding style and what birdwatching means to him. Do take a listen. At the end of May, I took a two-week vacation to Shetland. Shetland is an archipelago, or group, of about 100 islands, 16 of which are inhabited. It's the most northerly part of the United Kingdom. Sitting around 100 miles north of the Scottish mainland and 140 miles west of Norway... Its rugged coastline provides homes to internationally important colonies of seabirds, including great skewer, northern gannets and Atlantic puffins. Its location also means that it gets its fair share of rarities, especially after easterly winds, which, along with its regular summer migrants, make it a major draw for bird lovers. Being so far north, in the summer the sun barely leaves the sky and on clear nights outdoors it's possible to see without artificial light almost all night known as the Simmer Dim. I'm planning an episode in my trip report series, which will give more detail about the sites we visited and the birds we saw while in Shetland. But for now, I wanted to share with you a piece that I recorded while out with Natasha, a local resident and listener of this show. Natasha has been a long-time contributor to the show, and you've very likely heard her birding stories, so I was very excited to meet her. John, my husband, and I spent a whole day with Natasha, visiting some of her local birding sites. Luckily, Natasha is happy to bird at a slow pace, which is my preferred birding speed. And when we sat for a while at Ling Ness, listening to the water lapping the beach, watching the birds and chatting, I decided to record it to share with you. So I'm sitting by the sea on a small boulder beach at Ling Ness in Shetland with a blue sky gorgeous blue sea birds flying past and I'm sitting here with Natasha who is a a local resident and who's given me lots of tips about the sorts of birds we might see but thanks for joining me Natasha. Hi nice to be here with you it's great to actually finally meet in person. We've been having a good old chat sitting here and uh, thought it'd be really nice just to actually do a bird sit. We've had quite a few birds flying past and um and we've had some hilarity in trying to help each other describe where a particular bird might have landed on the rocks. And it was a shame we weren't recording that bit, but maybe it'll happen again. Um, so, so far, on the walk here, we've seen uh, two red-breasted magansas. Yeah, so you saw those flying in, didn't you? That's right, yeah. Um, but I wasn't absolutely sure. I thought that's what they were. I could see that they had... They, they almost feel horizontal between their their beaks their head neck and uh belly it just looks so different to when you see like for example a duck or a goose where you've got a definite bulge where the breastbone is um and they're they're very flat so i thought that's what they were but then i lost sight of them and as we rounded the 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 sort of coastline uh we saw them on the far shore and um yeah spotted that they were red-breasted magansas also saw some otter tracks so that was very exciting uh, in some soft mud so we'll be looking out for otter yeah and this is a place i've seen otter before so we're sort of hopeful of course all our laughter and chatting loudly probably isn't helping but but never mind 
There was the little ringed, sorry, I always say that, the little ringed plover. What I mean is a common plover, but because they're little, I always say, oh, look, there's a little ringed plover. And then I'm like, not a little with a capital L. <laughs> I've been doing exactly the same. So we've seen quite a few of these common ringed plovers, um, but there may be little ringed plovers around. And we've learned the identifying feature. So with the common ringed plover, they've got a, sort of a black mask over their eye. Uh, I mean, there are other features, but these are the things that I'm particularly looking for. And the little ringed plover has a yellow eye ring, which would stand out in the black mask. So they're the things that I'm looking for. And uh, one of the things I mentioned to Natasha previously was that I'm trying to get better at not assuming that the bird I'm seeing is something. So, like, we might see lots of ringed plovers and then just assume that what we're seeing is all common ringed plovers and there might be a little ringed plover in amongst them. Now, Natasha has picked up her camera and is looking intently at the shore. Do you want to tell me, what are you, what have you seen? Yeah, so I was just getting distracted. There's a pair of oyster catchers. Oh, one of them's just flown off. Um, over, over on some lovely lichen-coloured rocks. Um, so they started off with the one oyster catcher, sort of two rocks higher up, and slowly moved a little bit closer. And for a moment there, I thought I might get to see a bit of interaction between them, but actually they shared the same rock for a few minutes back to back oh. and then one flew off um so you know they're a little they're a little far away really for a really good photo but it's still nice when you get more than one bird in frame i think yeah absolutely especially with that lichen covered rock it's uh, just gorgeous soft lighting isn't it mm. and so the oyster catchers would stand out really well the oyster catchers are um i would say a, a large shore bird with um black and white plumage and very very strong red long bill which uh, is very distinctive. Um, and they also pipe a lot, make a lot of piping noises, so you might hear them calling out. Yeah, it was funny, when I was um, south on my travels the other week, I went to, to this one place that was, turned out to be an aviation museum and my parents were wandering around the museum and I was just totally sidetracked by all the birds. And the museum staff straight away sort of came, oh, you're looking at the birds. You must see our oyster catchers. And you know, they were very proud that they had these oyster catchers nesting on their roof. And it was lovely, but I also just didn't have the heart to tell them that they're probably the most common bird I see in Shetland. And I was really looking for things that I couldn't see in Shetland. One of them's just uh, peeked at us as it's flown by, but actually quite quiet for an oyster catcher. Yeah, so I, I was... don't know if it came through. No, I was expecting, you know, proper full-on peeping as it went past yeah. then, but, but not. Also, we've uh, seen some rock pipits and meadow pipits as we were walking up and skylarks were singing. Uh, we saw skylark, I think we saw one on the ground, didn't we, as well? Mm. Yeah, come, come yeah, down. I think so. Oh, um, there's, is that rock pipit going by? Ah, uh, it's... Yes. Yeah, it's just flown up onto the onto the rock. Yeah, so that's just gone up onto the lichen as well. So they're a, a, a much smaller bird. Um, going back to, to thinking of fruit, it's probably the size of a, a small oh, apple. Shag flying by. Oh yeah, another one of our larger seabirds. This is uh, the shag, which is not as large as the cormorant, which you might see, but the shag is a much more slender bird. And um, But from a distance, they can look quite similar. So it's looking at their behaviours that helps... Oh, hold on, the oyster catcher might be piping. Oh, I think the noise is being drowned out by the waves. <laughs> um, so the shags are much more slender than the great cormorant that we have. More likely to be found on the coast, I think. This is one of the things I've been trying to learn. When you see them in the right lighting, they've got a gorgeous greenish plumage. Um, much more slender bill and when they dive for fish they actually leave the water and do a kind of arched dive a very showy kind of dive um, they also fly low over the water with constant wing beats where I've read that cormorants fly higher and also cormorants will take pauses in their wing beats and sort of glide a bit as well so if you're seeing them from a distance, that's another way to, to tell them apart. Yeah, another thing that's useful actually in the breeding season is that the cormorants have white patches on the side. So that can be a really easy, easy way of telling them apart. Um, yeah, because both of them have kind of yellowish patches at the base of the bill towards the throat. Is that a rock dove? Yes, just leaving the land over there. It's quite far out. 
I just saw it come in and oh. then it headed straight out again. Is that the one coming back in again? I think it is, yes. Yeah. And Skylark singing again. Oh, and there's a turn just looking like it's going to start fishing. I'm always amazed when I see photos of them actually sort of at that moment of diving into the water. I've never yet managed to track one all the way down and, and, and achieve that. The oyster catch are just being flew. very quiet actually. They are, yeah. You know, it's one of those almost constant background noises I feel here. And I just get so used to hearing them all the time. It's funny to see them but not hear them. Yeah, I was absolutely sure at that point that this one was going to, to be piping loudly. They always seem to be complaining about something. Um, so we were sitting here, it's just so beautiful. It's a little bit windy, but it's very we're in the sort of shadow of the, the land, so we're a bit sheltered. As I said, blue sky, blue sea, just absolutely stunning, sparkles of light on the water, the waves just gently lapping against the boulders at our feet. And, you know, at first glance, you look around and you think, there's actually not much here. It's just, it's just rocks and sea. But then you'll notice movement and, you know, very often the birds are quite camouflaged, even the highly coloured ones. So, for example, there's an oyster catcher now sitting on the boulders of the beach. And um, if, you, if you're looking along and scanning, yes, you'll see the red bill and the black and white of the bird. But if you're just looking over and looking around, you could miss it. Unless it starts piping, in which case you won't. Uh, the, the rock pipits that have been around... You know, that you'll see them fly, but then they'll land. And if you don't actually see where they land, you're, you, you wouldn't know they were there. We think we might have seen a twite, which is a small finch. But we couldn't be absolutely sure. It was just out of the range of our binoculars. Um, is that a starling? Starling, yeah. Starling flying past over the waves. <laughs> uh, that's a bird that I've been amazed how many starlings I've seen while I've been in Shetland. Just everywhere. Um... What's that flying around up there? Is that a... Oh, is it a herring gull? It's a herring gull, but it's not yet in its full adult plumage. Right. In fact, I'm almost wondering, is it a blackback, a younger blackback? Because it looks quite dark. It's That's what I was going to say. It's hard to tell at this distance. And the sunlight. Really the and... size, yeah. I think it's a young blackback, actually. Yeah, it does it's look quite, quite large. Sure. It's just lazily turning circles yeah, over the water. The way the light falls on it, it's really hard to, to properly know what the, what the real shade is. So, yes, that, that's one of the frustrating things. When you know, the lighting conditions aren't quite right or the bird is just too far away, you just have to accept. You, you may get the idea of a type of bird, but you may not get the species. You see a fulmar over and in the distance but again just gone behind the land although we did have some quite close by earlier didn't we so there's nothing mm. to say that they wouldn't come closer and I think there's some over on that far shore over there I can see some white birds flying against the hillside yeah. over there and, and you'd be quite surprised in Shetland actually how often you come across you know a few former on random bits that actually don't seem like particularly high cliffs or a, a bit further inland than you might expect or occasionally just you know, they've taken over an old bit of ruined building. Um, yeah. So yeah, they're, they're surprisingly uh, common. No, that, that, exactly what you said there. So we've seen them on the side of a road in a kind of um, cutout where, where, you know, there's a, from where they've built the road, I think they've, they've got a cutout. Um, we saw them in Hostwick and the, the cliffs there aren't very high at all. So it's quite surprising that they've a former there, but they were all finding quite happy little um, spaces. I can see a great blackback. Um, so that bird that's just flying over to the right. There's something I hadn't really seen that much of, you know, just the odd one before I moved up here. So a bird I've really sort of enjoyed getting to see more of. They're really very impressive. Yeah, no, they're, they're scavengers, aren't they? They're very, mm -hmm. and they're very powerful birds. They'll take chicks, they'll 
take like dead animals and uh, they will bully other birds. I mean, I think great blackbacks and the great skewers are the main, um, <sighs> what's the word for carrion like eating yeah. birds? Yeah. And, and ravens. Oh, and the ravens, of course, yeah. Yeah, they're really yeah. powerful actually. You can see that one flying yeah, over the water really and it's strong wing yeah. beat. And you know, I had a couple occasions last summer when I was out walking and I inadvertently found that that I'd strayed onto the territory of a of a breeding uh, blackback. And they really make their presence known. You know, they very quickly get you to back off. I mean, the first time it happened, I was just, what, what's happening? This bird is dive bombing at me. And the second time, I very quickly thought, OK, I'm just going to turn direction here because, you know, I'm clearly on somebody's territory and probably has chicks now. Yeah, and when they're, when they're in that sort of defensive mode, or rather offensive mode, you don't really want to be at the wrong end of that bill. You really don't. So it looks like there's quite a lot of um, flies building up now, yeah. a lot of the sand flies, so might be time to continue our walk I think it might be yes <laughs> later in the walk we did actually see an otter swimming in the bay so that was really exciting to have the tracks confirmed my thanks to Natasha for being such a wonderful companion on that birding day and for passing on local bird news during the rest of our stay which helped to see birds that we might otherwise have missed while in Shetland, we were very much aware that avian influenza, or bird flu, was having a big impact on the gannet and skewer colonies, with dead birds visible in the sea and on beaches. Since returning home, I've seen that nesting sites in the northeast of England are also being badly affected. On Coquet Island, off the Northumberland coast, just this last couple of weeks, the UK's only breeding colony of roseate terns has been absolutely devastated by the virus. There's slightly more positive news that the puffins, fulmars and kittiwakes there seem to have been less affected, but there seems to be little that can be done for those birds that are ill to prevent them from infecting others. I'm hoping to speak with someone who knows more about avian influenza for a future episode. If you come across any dead or ill birds, don't touch them, but report them to the DEFRA helpline. Details are in the episode notes. On a more upbeat note, the surviving blue tits in my two nest boxes fledged successfully around the time we were on vacation. The box on our garage had started with 11 eggs. We lost quite a few birds along the way. It appeared mainly because the parents were unable to keep them fed. However, four healthy chicks left the nest box on the 27th of May, the day before we left for Shetland. In our garden nest box, which was a couple of weeks behind the garage one, we had seven eggs originally, with five chicks surviving to leave the nest box on the 8th of June, while we were away. Luckily, because we had the Wi-Fi camera boxes from Garden Nature, we were able to watch the last weeks of their progress, even though we were on vacation in Shetland. Even though the breeding season is mostly over for our garden birds, if you want to get your own Wi-Fi camera bird boxes set up for next season, do check out the Garden Nature website. I'm now an affiliate of Garden Nature, so when you use my link to buy their products, I'll get a small commission, at no extra expense to you. And listeners to the Casual Birder podcast can get 10% off their order by using the voucher code CBP10. The link to use for any purchases is in the episode notes. I'd like to do some shout-outs to friendly birders I've met in my travels recently. Simon at Keyhaven and Pennington Marshes gave us some great information about Wimbrel that had just flown past. I'd made the mistake of assuming they were curlew. Simon pointed out their call is different from the curlew and learning from his tips helped us to identify Wimbrel when we were in Shetland. And on Thursday Heath, we met Barnsley Birder, that's his Twitter handle, while we were watching Common Red Starts. And through chatting to him, found that we both knew my Twitter pal, Corvid Crazy Chap, who you'll be hearing from in a future episode. On Hazley Heath, we had a lovely chat with Peregrine, who stopped as he was riding by on his gorgeous horse. Peregrine gave us some really great tips about local birding sites. And Instagram's Ian Gray images helped me see my 159th species of the year, Barn Owl, at Titchfield Canal. Do take a look at his photos on Instagram. 
Also at Titchfield Canal, I chatted for a while to Nick, who's aiming for 100 species this year. And Shetland shout-outs to James, who helped us identify an Icterine warbler that had turned up, another lifer for me. Richard Ashby at Grutness with tips about birds to see on Shetland. Unfortunately, each of the tips didn't work out for us. So often with these things, you have to be there at just the right time. He told us about an osprey that was a sure thing, and it wasn't. But again, I don't blame Richard. I think we were just unlucky. And a shout out to Sue and Pete, who kindly let me look inside their camper van as we talked about having the freedom to spend time birding in Scotland. They spend a few weeks each year travelling around northern Scotland and Shetland. And um, the idea of spending some time on Fetler and just having your camper van to go back to sounded wonderful. And a final shout out to Vanilla, another talented photographer who posts on Instagram. We got chatting when I helped her confirm that a photograph she had taken was a red-throated diver. When I later looked at her photos on Instagram, I was green with envy. They're gorgeous. Thanks to everyone who kindly shared their bird knowledge with us. And the links to those who are active on social media can be found in the episode notes. If you'd like to help support the show's production, you can buy me a virtual coffee at ko-fi.com. Tips are being used to help pay for transcription costs. Three virtual coffees will pay for one month's automated transcription and five virtual coffees are required for each finalised transcription by a human. My current goal is £200, which will buy six months of automated transcription and the finalised episodes. We are now at 66% of the way to target. Thanks so much to everyone who's bought me a coffee and especially to those who've contributed since the last episode, Sean in Kosovo and Mary Lee in Vancouver. If you'd also like to contribute, you'll find the link to ko-fi.com in the episode notes. All of your support, financial or otherwise, is very much appreciated. Do keep in touch and tell me about your sightings. You can leave me a message on SpeakPipe or on the contact form on my website, casualbirder.com. Take a look at the episode notes for all the links. My thanks to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast.